retired police sergeant with 25 years experience with the city of Milwaukee Police Department. And during his police career, he was on street patrol. He participated and supervised different special units, anti-gang units, uh, violent crime task force, just to name a few. And later on, he supervised and participated in the investigations of hundreds of homicides, sexual assaults, and robberies. He hosts the Cops and Riders podcast, which is how I first heard Patrick, and great podcast. I highly recommend it to everyone. And in addition to podcasting, he's got the Facebook group, Cops and Riders. He also writes his own great series, Brew City Blues. And um, love that title. Yeah, isn't Thank it great? Uh-huh. And he lives in Wisconsin with his wife and his 10 pound rat terrier chihuahua mix that thinks he's a German shepherd. And in his spare time, Patrick works out and enjoys riding his Harley David motorcycle. So tonight he's going to talk to us about verbal judo and I'm excited to hear what he has to say. So Patrick, I'll turn it over to you. But uh, yeah. I wrote a couple of books called uh, Cops and Riders. One is the Academy to the Street. And that's a basic, you know, like how you become a police officer training equipment kind of the nuts and bolts and i thought that these are all meant for crime writers and then the second book is uh, cops and writers crime scenes and investigations how do we solve crimes how do we investigate crimes etc cetera, etc cetera. i go into the nuts and bolts of that so if as far as uh who i am what i did i think kathleen covered most of it i was with the milwaukee police department for 25 years my uh, first day in the academy was January 16 of 1995, and I retired January 16, 2020. So that was the plan. It wasn't because of what was going on or anything like that. It's like I had my 25 years. I get a full pension. I pop smoke. I was gone. Simple as that. So uh, that was that. Now, I do want to make... It's very clear that I'm not a verbal judo instructor and I can't go over everything in the book. It would just take too long. But I have been a student and practitioner of verbal judo in the classroom and the street. Um, also, I'm very approachable and easygoing, I think. If you have any questions while I'm going through all this, feel free to shoot, shoot them at me and we'll leave some time at the end. So when Kathleen <laughs> approached me about verbal judo, you know, I had flashbacks because I was in the academy in 1995, and I believe verbal judo started in 1993, formally. And I remember being in the classroom, and the instructor that was teaching us verbal judo wrote on the blackboard. Yes, it was a blackboard. We didn't have whiteboards or anything cool like that. <laughs> Not back then, at least. And he said it had like three things on there. One was respect. I appreciate that, but. And voluntary compliance. Those were on the blackboard. And he pointed to those and he said, the pretty much verbal judo are those three things. And you know, I'll go into it, you know, more specifically. Have any of you heard of verbal judo before this? No, no, I hadn't. Okay, it's the best way to put it is it's it's a book, and I do suggest getting that book because you can use it. You know, cops use it every day. Cops were using verbal judo long before there was a verbal judo class, long before people started talking about de-escalation. Probably from the dawn of police time, we've been talking about de-escalation. Just how do you talk to people? Because usually you're outnumbered on the street. You don't want to get into a fight. You know, that's, that's the whole... That's the goal. You want voluntary compliance from whoever you're having an encounter with. And these types of situations usually are with a no person. We call them no people because it's like, all right, turn around, put your hands behind your back, you're under arrest. No, they're not fighting with you per se, but 
they're not going along with the program. So you have options. And I've worked with police officers through the years that were such good salesmen and women that they could talk pretty much anybody into anything. And the bad guy is thanking them for putting the handcuffs on him. I mean, it's just really amazing how that works. So again, I'm going back, you know, I'm thinking of verbal judo and I'm looking, I'm thinking about all the stuff on the blackboard from the teacher. And the next thing that he said was, <clears throat> you have a gun and a badge and the power to take away someone's freedom. That doesn't excuse you from being a professional in the way you conduct yourself, the way you look and speak. Golden rule, treat others the way you want to be treated. If you kind of keep that mantra throughout your career in law enforcement, you'll do well. And I tried to do that as well. And most of the time, it works really, really well. People want to be respected. They want to be treated decent. No matter what they may have done or or whatever, everybody wants to be treated with respect. So golden rule, treat others the way you want to be treated. I told a story about how many times I would ask prisoners in the back of my squad what radio station they wanted to listen to in my Cops and Writers Facebook group. You know, I'd arrest somebody for whatever the reason, and they're going along with the program. You know, they're being very cooperative. And I said, yeah. I'd be like, hey, what do you want to listen to on the way to jail? And they're looking at me like, really? I'm like, yeah, I don't care. So it's like, yeah, you know, could you put it on? Yeah, no problem. You know, they'd be singing and humming and it was like, okay, they're not fighting. They're not spitting. They're not, it's a seamless, almost painless trip to jail. And one of the members in the cops and writers group said, well, why are you coddling cr criminals? And I'm like, it's not coddling them. You want them to be cooperative. You know, when somebody's in your custody, you're responsible for them until they are in jail. Even then, if there's a problem, you have to take care of it. Sometimes they turn suicidal. Sometimes, you know, they're a diabetic. They need to go to the hospital or whatever the case may be. You're married to that person until you're done with your reports your boss signs off on them and you go on your merry way and they go to the, either they get released or they go to the county jail. So what kind of relationship do you want with this person? That doesn't mean you agree with whatever they may have done. That doesn't mean you're going to be, you know, there's, there isn't going to be any presence under the tree with their name on it, but Hey, you know what? You want it as seamless as possible and you want it as, you want voluntary compliance. That's the name of the game. So I got to give props to Dr. George Thompson, who literally wrote the book, Verbal Judo, The Gentle Art of Persuasion. He's an interesting guy. I uh, I got a chance to go to an eight-hour course. He came to our police, to, police academy, and he, <coughs> excuse me, he spoke to some of our uh, supervisors, and I was a newer supervisor, so I was forced to go and we called it gerbil voodoo <laughs> class. Nobody wanted to go because, hey, we're a bunch of cops. We we don't want to sit in the classroom for eight hours, but we did. And I'm glad we did. He He's a very, like I said, a very interesting guy. Uh, I have the paperback and the audio version of the books. I like the audio version because the voice actually sounds like him. Whoever did the narrator, he didn't do the audio. And he gets all the inflections correct and actually how Dr. Thompson talked. Yeah, Dr. Thompson had a doctorate in English and was an English teacher before he was a cop. And he also had two black belts, one in judo, <laughs> judo, judo and another one in jiu-jitsu. Both are empty hand or what some call soft martial arts. You're redirecting another's aggressive energy. And he used this in his inventing of verbal judo, redirecting a person's aggressive or negative energy through deflection or diffusion. Again, how do you talk to people? And he actually put a curriculum together about this. Very interesting stuff. Again, like I told you before, I, I, I did get to, um, 
go to this class. And unfortunately, Dr. Thompson developed throat cancer. And you could tell the poor guy was in pain. And it was hard for him to talk, but he kept, he was a soldier. He kept on going forward. And one of the first thing that he said was interesting to me. He's, he talked about us being peace warriors. As cops, you must be a warrior in certain situations. Who else is going to run towards gunfire or an active shooter when everybody else is running in the opposite direction or run into a burning building or talk a suicidal person off a bridge or any other dangerous situation that normal scene people would shy away from. That doesn't mean you are given carte blanche to be a bully or a thug. It's quite the opposite, actually. You have lots of power, but you also have a great deal of responsibility towards the community. You got to build trust. If that gets broken, it takes a lot to build that back. You have responsibility to your fellow cops. Nobody likes a bad cop. Nobody likes a bully cop. I've worked with cops that because they couldn't talk to people very well, they could make Mother Teresa or Gandhi a no person. They can make them a fighter. And it's and that just makes for a very long night. So nobody likes that. And you have to have some responsibility and respect for yourself. You have to sleep at night. I slept like a baby because I know I never stepped out of bounds. I never took cheap shots. And I always, always tried to do the right thing. And that's what 99% of the cops do. And that's what this course taught also. Your ultimate goal is peace and a potential violent encounter with peaceful outcome. So you might be thinking, how do I do this? What you say and the way you say it. So if I'm in a situation and it's not escalating and I don't think it's going to be violent, you know, I'll say, sir, could you put your hands behind your back, please? Okay. Instead of put your hands behind your back. And it's like right away, they're going to be on the defense. If things are going smoothly, why would I want to rile that person up? Even though I've seen people do it instead, you know, sir, can you please put your hands behind your back? You got some old business you got to take care of. You're going to be coming with me tonight. And it's like, all right. You know, it's like, looks like you missed a court date. You're going to have to see the judge in the morning. And you'll probably be home by afternoon. I've said this hundreds of times over 25 years. Not And also, I've always said it in a non-condescending tone. Again, how you say things is very, very important. So this worked out about 90% of the times. Most of the rest situations ended in a peaceful conclusion. Somebody putting their hands behind their back, putting the cuffs on, and that was the end of it. But you'll never see that on the evening news. Cop treated a criminal with empathy and respect, and the bad guy went to jail, and the cop went home after finishing his reports. Doesn't sell advertising dollars. Nobody cares. But that's usually what happens in the real world. One big caveat. Sometimes you say things the right way, and you say the right things, and the incident can go sideways or go south in a blink of an eye. You always have to be vigilant. Even if you're giving the if you're giving the uh how can I put it? If I'm giving you the illusion that I'm 100 percent laid back, comfortable, everything's honky dory. I'm still on my guard because anything can happen. I'll tell you a story. I had a recruit seven o'clock in the morning. We get dispatched to a boy girl trouble. They're having a verbal argument. It was in one of the city's housing projects. So we get down there and it's a gentleman that's probably about eh, six foot three, six foot four, a very solid 250 and his girlfriend and the girlfriend's mom. Girlfriend and mom are yelling at him for whatever reason. And he's just standing there like, okay, okay. So I thought to myself, it's like, all right, we can handle this. I've handled a hundred of these. And what happened was my partner who was a recruit, he probably was out of the academy for about three or four weeks. So he was very, very green, but he was a sheriff's deputy. 
before he joined the city department. He was a sheriff's deputy for, I think, three years. So he had some street experience and he had experience talking to people. So I felt very comfortable with him. So I could tell this gentleman was not happy and things were kind of getting a little tense and safety first. I said, hey, you know what? I'm going to pat you down for weapons. Is that okay? Notice I'm asking. Even though I'm still going to do it, people like to be asked. They don't like people demanding stuff, right? I mean, that's that's with just about everything. So I, tr I go behind him because it's a lot safer to pat somebody down from behind. The reason being, they can't get target acquisition on you if they're going to punch you or whatever. You have the upper hand if you're behind him. So I'm like, yeah, put your arms out like an airplane. He didn't do that. Instead, his shoulders went up like this, and he started bawling his fists. Now, this all happened in about a second. We call that resistive tension. Something is going to happen. So something clicked inside my brain like, hmm, this is not okay. But again, it happened within about a second or two. He spun around, and he tried tackling me without saying a word. So I dropped my center of gravity. Now we're like locked in a Greco-Roman wrestling match. And he's a lot bigger than me. Yeah, I'm 5'9". And back then I probably weighed 220. And I'm like, all right. So I, I dropped my center of gravity. He's trying to tackle me. Then before I know it, his hand's on my gun. I'm like, okay, this has escalated very quickly. So his girlfriend... <laughs> And the mom are screaming at the top of their lungs. I don't know what my recruit, I think, was getting on the air, and he was calling for help, which is good. He could have shot that guy, you know, because he's going for my gun. So what happened was I gained control of his head with one hand, and if somebody has their hand on your gun, you put your hand over their hand. So it's not going anywhere. So we're kind of doing this weird dance. We're shuffling around. Finally, I was able to control his head, and I actually started hitting his head up against a metal mailbox until he was unconscious. So cavalry comes, ambulance comes. Then in the hospital, you know, they started talking to him. He said, yeah, what happened was he was on parole for armed robbery. He just got done spending four hours in prison at four hours, four years in prison, and he violated his parole and he knew that he violated it. So he was going back to prison. So me and my recruit were the only two things that were standing between him and going back to prison. So he told him that, yeah, I was going to take that cop's gun. I was going to shoot him and his partner and I was going to take off. So that's just one example of all the talking in the world and all the cool de-escalation stuff that you hear on TV, TV or the media or whatever doesn't mean anything. You know, it could be a second or two, and you're literally fighting for your life. So that's what happened to me. That's just one time something like that happened. But again, like I told you before, you know, people would rather be asked than told. Sir, can you put your hands behind your back? Please. I was raised right. I, I'm a, my little Irish Catholic mom you know, be please, thank you. Manners were everything. And that doesn't change when you become a cop. You know, it's like, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Thank you, please. Even when it's a criminal. And it's like, please, put your hands behind your back. But I will also say, and what drives me bananas, is watching uh, footage of cops asking somebody to do the same thing over and over and over and over. After the first or second time, if they don't go along with the program, they don't want to go to jail, then you got some choices to make. One choice is to escalate. We call it the bat belt. You got all kinds of stuff on that thing. You got tasers, batons, pepper spray, and then, you know, the highest would be, you know, your firearm. That would be, you know, lethal uh, force. Or you could tactically i don't like using the word retreat but maybe it, if you're by yourself and you're outgunned you're outnumbered maybe it's time to kind of backpedal a little bit until the cavalry arrives 
then go in and arrest said person. No shame in that. So again, people would rather be asked than told, sir, put your hands behind your back, please. And hey, thank you for that. I, I said that a lot. And I always smile. When I was about to arrest somebody, it's like, not a condescending, I'm an asshole smile. Like, hey, yeah, you're going to jail. But in, instead, it was, uh, hey, you know, yeah, I have empathy for you. Yeah, you had a little fight tonight, you know, with with your wife. You know, things aren't going so great. Yep. You're going to have to go to jail, but, you know, it'll be okay. It actually works. Um, people prefer to have options over threats. That's that is good with no people. I'll I'll tell you a good story. Me with another recruit of mine. He used to he played. Uh, I think it was left tackle for Michigan State. He was gonna go to the pros, but he blew his knee out in one of the bowl games. The Bears and the Dolphins were courting him. He was gonna go. I think his senior year, I don't know, something like that, but. He blew his knee out, so boom, he became a cop. This guy was six foot three, six foot four, three hundred pounds, with a thirty-two inch waist, and he could bench press over five hundred pounds. He was, and he was, he also had some of the quickest hands, and he could do the splits. I mean, he was just an amazing, amazing athlete. All he did was work out. That was his. He loved to work out, four or five hours a day, easily. And his big thing was he hated overtime because he wanted to get off of work. We were working midnight to eight. Again, seven o'clock in the morning, we get a call for uh, repossession. There's a repo man taking somebody's car and the person who owns said car <clears throat> hit it behind their house. Now, not the best neighborhood. And these, I don't know how he got it back there to tell you the truth. You know, these houses are really close together. And there was no landscaping. It was spring in Wisconsin and there was mud everywhere. So I'm like, oh, this is not going to be good. So we get there. What happened was repos the repo man came with a tow truck and started hooking up his car that he wasn't paying for. And the dude that owned the car, you know, they have a verbal argument. Then he says, I'm going to go in my house and get my gun. I'm going to blow your head off. So he went in, got his gun, pointed it at the repo man, but didn't shoot him. So he calls us. We get there. And the guy, he was pretty big. He, he was a big dude. You know, he's probably about six foot three, six foot four. Not in as good of shape as my partner but he was a big guy. So, you know, it's like, okay, now it's time for options. And I looked at the guy and I said, you know, here's the deal. I said, you, you just got to put your hands behind your back. You're going to jail. It's a misdemeanor. It's not a felony. If you start fighting with us, it's going to be a felony. And, you know, and I'm standing next to my partner. That's as big as a, a house <laughs> so that made things a little easier and the guy is like no not going with you not putting my hands behind you not doing it <laughs> so then my partner you know big old bob there is like hey listen dude says i should be working out by now you know now it's past eight o'clock in the morning he says i should be in the gym and he said you're a big dude i'm a big dude we're gonna win i'm gonna whoop your ass but you could get some licks in too. And you said, you might hurt me. And then I can't go work out. And that is not acceptable. So just put your hands behind your back and let's go to jail. Again, you're still in the land of misdemeanor. You're not in felony land right now. So what's going to happen to you? Yeah, you're going to go to jail to by tomorrow. You'll probably get a recognizance bond and you'll be out. If we have, you know, battle Royale back here and we start fighting, you're, it's going to be a couple of days before you see your house. You know, you know, are you married? Do you have kids? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm sure they don't appreciate this. Do you have a job? Yeah. Well, you're going to miss work. You know, one day is okay, but you're going to miss two or three. Do you want a felony on your record? No. Okay. So 
you give them options. Now, could it have gone to shit really fast? Yes. He could have pulled out a gun. We could have been in a gun battle. He could have tried tackling one of us. There's a hundred different things that could have happened. But we deflected his anger and his, you know, he, his biggest gripe at that moment in time was there's a tow truck in his backyard taking away his car. It's embarrassing. It sucks. He's probably made, I don't know, X amount of payments on it. You know, he hadn't been lately. That's why they're repossessing it. But still, nobody wants that to happen to them. So we had to show some empathy. We're putting ourselves in his shoes. Am I being sympathetic towards him? Nah, not really. But I'm trying to put myself in his shoes and see where he's coming from and what his train of thought is. It's safe. I We also had some other officers there. And we had the opportunity to where, okay, we can give this guy some options and tell him what's going to happen. So we did that. And remember before I said, you know, one of the phrases that was on the blackboard when I was brand new, I appreciate that, but use that a bunch of times. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to kick your ass. I appreciate that. But if you do, this is what's going to happen. You know, we're going to kick your ass and you're probably going to get hurt. And again, you wind up with a felon. Do you really want that? So we're just deflecting. So <laughs> we could have just threatened him and just started the fight. But nobody wants that. Everybody wins with voluntary compliance. The, at the end of the day, what you really, really, really want is, hey, the guy turning around, putting his hands behind his back, we're putting handcuffs on him, and I'm asking him, what radio station he wants to listen to on the way to jail. That's a win for everybody. Now you can use hard talk and verbal judo at the, and verbal judo at the same time. I'll tell you a story. I was one man again, working late shift midnight to eight. It was a busy night. There was like two or three shootings in the district that I worked at. And I thought by some grace of God, I'd be getting off of work on time. It's seven o'clock in the morning. I'm done at eight. I'm like, okay, come on. I, I can make it. I can make it. You know, this is cool because I was working overtime like every day. So I'm thinking to myself, all right, I can uh, get home on time. Everything will be cool. So we get a call over the air. Uh, there's only two one-man cars. and We're the only two that were available because of all these shootings from the night before. And it's like squad 50, and it's like 50, standby 51. And it's like, ooh, that's not good. So it's a two-man assignment. So they take they send two cars. And it's take the man shooting a rifle out of a window at his neighbors. And it's like, okay. And there was multiple calls from different people. So it's like, okay, this is real. If you get multiple calls from different people, most likely this is not BS. Because a lot of calls that you get like that, they're BS. They're a bunch of BS. But this was very real. So my uh, partner <laughs> that I was working with that night on a different squad, I got him on a side channel. I'm like, dude, I said, you know, park a block away. We're going to do this tactically. And, you know, this is very real. And he said, dude, I just want to get off of work on time. He says, man, my old lady's going to kick my ass. And he's, you know, I've been working overtime every, I, I understand that, Wojo. But we got to make it home in one piece, too. This guy's, you know, we got some nut with a rifle shooting rounds out his window. And it's very real because all these people are calling. He said, yeah, yeah, right, whatever. And he started laughing at me. And I'm like, all right, well, Wojo. So I park a block away. I got the shotgun. And Wojo is not answering the radio. I'm like, oh my God, something happened to Wojo. So now the dispatcher is calling for a bunch of squads to help us out from different districts. But we knew that would take some time. So I got the shotgun. I'm mirroring around houses. I'm being all tactical. And I see Wojo's car right in front of the house. I'm like, I'm like Wojo, what are you thinking? You never, first off, you don't park in front of anybody's house, even if it's a barking dog. Because that's carte blanche for an ambush. You always have to think tactically. Now, if 
you get calls of somebody that's shooting off a rifle, well, that ramps it up a few hundred degrees. And it's like, all right, you should have. <laughs> what are you thinking? You're not. So the squad is empty. Wojo's inside. It was a four family apartment house. And the front door was open. So I go in and I hear Wojo upstairs, the, the officer talking upstairs. And I could tell he was agitated. And I'm like, okay. So I'm going up the stairs. I'm looking, peeking around corners. Again, I got the shotgun. We didn't have rifles back then. And I go into this apartment because the apartment door is open. I can hear Wojo and he's using hard talk. This is why we call this. Dude, put down the rifle. You know, just put it down. Stand up, put your hands behind your back. And this guy wasn't saying anything. So I take a peek into the bedroom. This guy's laying on the bed in his boxers holding, I think it was an eight-year-old kid. It was his son. And he had a rifle to his, the kid's head. And I'm really, like, oh, well, I didn't have a clear shot with a shotgun. We didn't have slings, and I didn't want to put it on the ground. Wojo didn't have a clear shot, because but this guy's finger was not on the trigger, even if it would still would have been a clean shoot, but we don't want to hurt the kid. This poor kid is just like just whimpering. He's crying his eyes out. And we're like, and obviously this guy's super agitated. He's sweating profusely. So he's under the influence of something. So we're using hard talk, giving him commands. But at the same time, Wojo, who actually had a good conversation going with this guy, is like, listen, dude, you know, you can hear sirens coming down the block. He said, that's the SWAT team. There's going to be negotiators here. The SWAT team's going to be here. He said, you know what? You're probably leaving in a box. So here's your choice. You can either spend hours and they'll probably wind up shooting you. Or you can stand up like a man, put your hands behind your back and let's get this shit over with. Okay. So the guy looked at him, he looked at me and he's like, all right, put down the rifle, stood up, put his hands behind his back. And we're like walking out and the SWAT team and everybody's running up the stairs. Like we got this guys. <laughs> but that's an example of, he used hard talk and he used verbal judo at the same time. Verbal judo. You know, again, it's called verbal judo. I don't know if Wojo was awake during verbal judo class, but he could have been a stand-up comic. The guy knew how to talk to people. He could talk people into almost anything. He was charming as heck. So we also, in verbal judo and in law enforcement, we use scripts. I'll give you an example. Probably a good example of where it's a non-felony traffic stop. This is an example of an interaction with the public. Usually it can become kind of chippy, I guess is the best way to put it. I, you know, I clocked you going 45 in a 25 zone. No, you didn't. I wasn't doing that. You know, there's a hundred that's where a lot of just tit for tat stuff could happen. So he actually came up with a script and it's actually pretty good. So I stopped Kathleen on a traffic stop. This is the way I'm going to approach. It's like, my name is Sergeant O'Donnell, Milwaukee police. The reason why I stopped you today is you're going 50 miles an hour and it posted 25. Do you have any legal justification for this? So you kind of take the air out of the balloon. First off, you know my name. It kind of humanizes stuff. It's like, yeah, I'm Sergeant O'Donnell. It's no big mystery. I'm not trying to hide it. It's on my uniform. You know, some people, you know, it's like, I want your name and badge number. And one of the biggest mistakes a cop can make is like, no. It's like, why? I'm not hiding anything. You know, it's like, yeah, there it is. You know, 404 is the badge number. There's my name. Do you want me to spell it for you? Be more than happy to. You know, it's... And, <laughs> don't say yeah it's going to be on the ticket you'll you'll see all that on the ticket but you know that's where a lot of the piston matches start so again I, I tell you who i am it takes away that it humanizes you and having that script it takes away potential fights about why you stopped why you stopped them there's no big mystery i clock you going 50 and a 25 
then you, then you give them a chance to tell you why they broke the law. Do you have any legal justification? Yeah, I wasn't paying attention or, you know, I was on my way to a funeral. I was running late. Uh, <sighs> probably one of the most ones that I heard the most was I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and, you know, I, you kind of, I totally empathize with that. <laughs> I can totally understand why that would be a problem. But 99% of the time they're like, yeah. And it's like, okay. And then the ending is just as important as the beginning. If you're giving them a warning, because there's what, three different ways a traffic stop can end. One, you get a verbal warning or a written warning. And when that would happen, it'd be like when you're parting ways, hey, have a nice day. The person's thinking to himself, whew, I didn't get a ticket. I don't have to spend $300. I didn't get, you know, six points on my license or whatever. If you give them a citation, I would say it's on like, be safe, drive careful, something like that. Don't say, have a nice day. That's being a smart ass because they're not going to have a nice day. They're going to talk about getting that ticket for how long. That's just the way it is. So don't be that person. You know, that's, that's the way we're trained. Or you arrest somebody. This is like... This and all verbal judo is not 100% guaranteed. You know, it, it just makes it more likely that the encounter will turn out positive. Just a little bit more. Uh, let's see. The history of law enforcement and de-escalation. There is no mystery here. Cops have been talking to people for as long as there's been cops. No cop wants to fight. Every time I was in a fight, I got hurt. I didn't like to fight. I knew how to fight. But I didn't like doing it because every time I'd get done and be like, ooh, that feels weird. That didn't hurt before. And then you wake up the next morning and it's like, if I, if any of you have ever been in a car accident, you know it hurts a lot more the next day. And then the same thing with fighting. It's just like, oh, man, what? That sucked. I, I wish that didn't happen. So most cops, most sane cops, don't go to work saying, boy, I hope I get into a real rip-roaring fight today. Nobody does that. And it's been after you've been on for a little bit and you've got some fights under your belt, then you're like, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, when I was 21 years old in Invincible, maybe I didn't speak as well as I do now. And it's like, okay, now I'm older. And it's like, okay, now I'm talking to somebody that's 10 years younger than me, probably in better shape. And can whoop my ass. So guess what? I you have to learn how to talk to people. And that's just the way it is. Yeah, you know, de escalation. That's kind of like this later latest catchphrase. I was at an in service and they were showing a video of these cops that went to some kind of domestic situation. And the man ran out of the side of the house with this huge butcher knife. And he was running at the cops. And he was chasing the cops around the squad car in circles. Now, both cops were very, very good runners. They both did triathlons. They were in amazingly good shape, etc. Now, <laughs> me, I, I would have to shoot the person. I'm not going to get stabbed. And I know this person was totally going to outrun me. You know, it's like, you don't have much of a choice. So, you know, I was disturbed by watching this. And, you know, what he, the instructor didn't talk about was, it's like, okay, it turned out to be a positive influence, a positive outcome because the person dropped the knife, they arrested him, end of story. I said, okay. What if some kid was on his big wheel coming down the sidewalk and this person turns around and stabs them while they're playing ring around the rosy with a squad car? Or what if his girlfriend ran out of the house trying to stop what was going on and he stabs a girlfriend? I guarantee those cops would be going to prison and getting, well, obviously getting fired and probably going to prison because they didn't act. They ran away. 
So after the class, the person who was teaching was a lieutenant that I worked with for years. And I'm like, dude, not cool. I said, I understand that you're trying to show there's different ways of handling things, but there's young cops in here and they're thinking that's the only way they can handle something like that. I said, that's going to get somebody killed. And he said, it's out of my hands, OD. And I'm like, I know politicians and command staff that have been hiding their oh, most of, if not all of their careers, that the last time they were in a fight was in the academy, you know, practicing 20, 25 years ago. So that's very, that's a very slippery slope that I see things going right now. So question, when is verbal judo or de-escalation used? My answer is most of the time with a no person, most violent confrontations happen. Well, let me ask you guys this. When do you think most violent confrontations happen with police officers? Take a guess. I'd say domestics. Traffic stops. Yeah, domestic violence, I would think. People are out of control. <laughs> All right. Or when, you're, when they, you're, a you're getting close. They see the cop as a bully. When do, they, when do you think a cop is going to most likely wind up in a physical confrontation with somebody? Like when what somebody's part, under the influence. What Abuse. part of the contact? It's when you say you're under arrest, put your hands behind your back. Because they feel they have no option, they're losing it, it whatever. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's when the battle royales begin. You know, that's when about 90% of the fights with cops happen is it's like, okay, it's time to go to jail. Most of the time, these people have already gone to jail and they don't like it there. So it's like, okay, <laughs> it's like, you're going to jail. I don't want to go to jail. Then the fight's on, you know, and a lot of times all the talking in the world isn't going to change that. Unfortunately, there has been a rise in ambush style attacks on police officers. You know, like what I talked about, the guy who was on parole that I stood between him and going back to his cellmate, <laughs> you know, for another four years and he wanted to kill us. You know, that happens too, but a lot less frequently than I want to escape these cops. I want to get out of here. I don't want to go to jail. That's mm -hmm. when a lot of that happens. So, like I said before, and unfortunately, there is a rise in ambush style attacks in the last couple of years. Oh, let's see here. <laughs> Can you think of any other instances where verbal judo would be effective not in a arrest situation but what other situation that a police officer would be in that they could use this i think maybe if somebody again is thinking of suicide jumping off of something perfect good for you <laughs> yeah that you get the gold star barb all right <laughs> i'll tell you a story you know i I, we get sent to a subject with a knife. We get there, and this guy has a big old butcher knife pointed to his chest. And we're like, hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're, we got good communication going with him. You know, he's, he's a young guy. He's probably like 21, 22 years old. And it's like, dude, you don't want to do this, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And he just smiled at us, and he just plunged it into his chest. He starts running, he makes, and we had this like maybe two or three seconds of everybody looked at each other, including the guy who just stabbed himself, like <laughs> everybody's jaws dropped, like, well, we didn't see that coming. And he took off, he started running and we're like, and he didn't make it. He, he made it like maybe 20 feet and he wound up collapsing, but he survived. He didn't die. Hmm. So a year later, <laughs> we get called for a, a man with a knife, different part of town, but the same day to, but just a year later, the same day. Oh, wow. And it's like, okay. And we're all like, hmm. it didn't register to us. It was just another day. And we get there and I'm like, oh my God, it's the same dude with a <laughs> big ass knife. And I'm like, 
now it's like, okay, now I can use some verbal judo. And I'm like, all right, here's your options, dude. And I said, here's the thing. You remember a year ago when you stabbed yourself in the chest? And he says, yeah, I remember that. I said, I bet it sucked. I bet that hurt like hell. And you survived. You're not good at killing yourself. So tell you what, why don't you just put that knife down so you don't have to go through that pain again? Remember the pain. And he looked at me, he's like, man, that hurt like hell. And I'm like, I'm sure it did. He dropped the knife and that was the end of it. We took him off to the hospital and that was it. But, you know, I presented options to him. I talked to him. You know, hostage negotiators, they use this all the time. You know, it's not just in arrest situations. Like you said, I I had a guy on a bridge that was going to jump. Same thing. And it's like, you just start talking to him, develop that, hey, I'm Pat. You know, try, you know, yeah, I'm wearing a uniform. That's an automatic barrier for some people. But you try to humanize it. And it's like, okay, do you have any pets at home? Mm-hmm. They're like, what? So, well, if you're going to jump off this bridge, somebody has to take care of your pets. Mm-hmm. Just let me know, you know, where it is and we'll, we'll take care of that for you. And they're like, huh? But it, it wound up being a wrestling match and we did pull them off the bridge. But, you know, that's, again, you're kind of diffusing, you're trying to diffuse the situation and you're trying to redirect what's going on. It's like, yeah, do you have any pets? Do you have any loved ones? I mean, it's like, you know, what can I do for you? Let me help you out with that. And he, I had uh, one of my good buddies. He had the, the person on the bridge as well. <laughs> and he just kept on telling me. So, yeah, yeah, I tried doing this, you know, a couple of months ago. And, you know, blah, blah, blah. He says, obviously, you're not good at it. So when you get off that bridge, <laughs> you know, and, and it worked like Lucky Charms. And it was like, yeah, you're right. And more than one time, I would have a situation like that. And I use the old from lethal weapon remember when uh mel gibson's on top of the building with the jumper hey my boss is down there you know looking you know you know cut me some slack here i've used that a hundred times i'm like hey dude my boss is over there could you i'm sure you've had a boss or you have a boss could you help me out here (laughs) so i'm letting them think that hey they're helping me Mm. i'm not doing anything with them they're helping me so that works out really good Again, the cornerstone of all of this is empathy, empathy, empathy. That doesn't mean you're weak. It doesn't mean that you're even sympathetic to the person that you're encountering. You're just putting yourself in their shoes. So some quick and easy ways to avoid fights or confrontation. This is just my experience. If you can, take a couple of seconds before you respond with anger words. This is with your spouse, with your teenage kids, with whoever you know take that second or two take a deep breath and all right you still might say the same thing who knows but i tell you what people remember words a lot more than they remember remember ass whoopings or anything like that they remember when you said x y or z it was totally just mean-hearted and you know it it really digs into you. It gets under your skin. Everybody can remember, like, if a parent said that to you or a loved one, somebody that you trusted and said something horrible to you, you're just like, where did that come from? And you remember it forever. So think before you say whatever. Take a breath and look ahead. Long before I was a cop, I was selling cars. I was a restaurant manager. I was selling cars. I was doing all kinds of stuff. And we had a new rental um, department at the dealership I was working at. The guy who was in charge of it was a retired race car driver. And I asked him one day, we're just shooting the breeze. I'm like, what's the key to being a good race car driver? He said, Patrick, it's just like life. A good race car driver isn't looking at the car in front of them. Of course they are, but I'm looking at two or three or four cars ahead of me. He says, I'm thinking about what I'm going to do 15, 20 seconds from now. Same thing with boxers. That's moving chess. Chess champions, but they're thinking like eight, nine, ten moves ahead. 
if you can do that, that will really help with confrontations. You know, if I say this, yeah, you know, and always think ahead of, you know, what you're going to say and just think ahead, what will happen if you say this, if I say this, it will get a reaction, but my wife won't talk to me for a few days and nobody's going to be happier then. Younger days when I was in brawls, yeah, I was kind of a punk ass kid. I could, you know, it's like I could probably get kick your butt. And I got into fights when I was younger. I had horrible, horrible Irish temper. Then I started martial arts. I was in Aikido, I was in judo, I was in kickboxing for four years. And you get a certain mindset. It's like, okay, I probably could kick your butt, but I'm probably going to get arrested you know, thinking ahead, I'm probably going to get arrested. This is going to cost me a bunch of money, embarrassment, maybe some future career opportunities. Is it really worth it? Is it worth, you know, it's like, because this guy disrespected me, said something, whatever. Mm -hmm. I remember more than one time I'd be at a tavern after kickboxing and, you know, I remember I got into it with some guy over something s silly. And I was thinking about that. I was like, okay, Pat, Think ahead of the game a little bit, and it's like, all right, I'll I'll redirect them. Said, so, you know what? You look like you're a pretty tough, dude, but I bet I can do more push-ups than you. Mm -hmm. I'll bet you two pitchers of beer, yeah. not one, but two. And I said, do you want to start or do you want me to? And all they always always is like, you go. I'm like, all right. Back then, I wasn't like in the best shape, but I could do push-ups till the cows came. And after I hit about seventy-five or a hundred. They just like, yeah, okay. What kind of beer do you want? <laughs> and we're and then we're drinking beers and having fun. So there's all kinds of different ways to deal with that. So let's see, it's 9:10 right now. Why don't we open this up for questions? I talk way too long. No. What if uh, the uh a lot of the police work right now is dealing with very angry protesters. Uh, is there some special verbal judo you can employ in that situation, or you just have to? You know, it depends on what's going on. If you're standing on the line, which I have done, we've been. If you if you're ever bored and you want to go to YouTube or Google, you can go to Sherman Park riots. We had a. Uh, police officer shoot and kill somebody and it got spread through the neighborhood that the cops shot an unarmed man in the back. Of course it didn't happen that way at all, but before we knew it, the city was on fire. It got to the point where it wasn't safe for the fire department to put out the fires. So if you're standing on the line and you, you got your helmet and baton and shield and it's like, the main thing to do is not get into a confrontation. You know, they could, they could talk all they want and they're going to egg you on. They'll talk about, you know, your wife, they'll talk about your daughter. They'll talk about whatever they want you to fight with them. So leave that out as a good boss. You don't leave somebody on that line for a very long time. Mm -hmm. 15, 20 minutes. That's enough. You recycle your people. You put in fresh people. Okay, now it's your turn to take some verbal abuse. You know, cooler heads will prevail when it comes to that type of thing. So that's that's my main thing is like keep fresh people on the line and don't even talk to them. You know, they're angry, they're spitting, they're throwing things, whatever. Obviously, safety is number one. You have to keep your people safe and you have to be safe. If they're throwing things at you or whatever, you have to respond. But, you know, sticks and stones, you know, you could say this, that, and the other thing. All right. But cops are human too. They can only handle so much. That's when you got to take them off that line. Okay. Next. Yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering, Go ahead. I'm wondering, do your... Do your tactics change if you're dealing with someone who um, is er erratic and unreasonable and unpredictable, unpredictable? Because 
um, they're on some kind of substance or because they have mental health issues? You know, that's a very good question. I worked midnight to eight for 13 years. Then I worked seven at night till three in the morning for another four years. So most of the calls I went to, people were under the influence of something. Drugs, alcohol, mental health crisis, whatever the case may be. So I worked with a guy that was really, really good with drunks. I, he just, he spoke drunk really well. <laughs> you know, you have an angry drunk about whatever. And he says, Leon, I haven't seen you for years. And the guy's looking at me and he says, do I know you? And he's like, yeah, man, man, we, we did this and that, you know, blah, blah. And he's like, well, he's no longer acting erratic. He's just acting like, how do I know this cop? <laughs> you know, before you know it, they're best friends. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it's all how you handle people. Mm. Yeah. You know, but if you're, I'll give you another example of, I was on day shift. We got called from a uh, a gal that had her adult brother living with them, living with her. Excuse me. You know, she was probably in her early forties. He was in his around the same age, maybe a little little bit younger. He was a combat vet, really bad PTSD. He was on a three day bender. He hadn't slept for three days. And she says, "I know he's taking all kinds of drugs." He's take he's drinking like crazy. He's talked about killing himself and killing us. Okay. He needs to go to the hospital. And we don't want to hurt him. This is a vet. He's going through, you know, a crisis. So we go downstairs, we start trying to get a dialogue with him and things were not going well. It's like, okay, he needs to go to the hospital. You know, I've got an ambulance there and the fire department there staging because they're not going to go in. And he was so erratic that we also had mental health professionals that we could call, but they weren't going to go in because it was just way too dangerous. That's another fallacy that you see in the media and TV or whatever. Well, we need, you know, it's like, no, a lot of these instances, they're not even going to go into them because they're way too dangerous. So we're talking to him. It's nothing's working. Now he's getting very aggravated he's talking about how he's going to kill us and kill himself you know yada 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 it's like all right so i look at my cop and i'm like tase him so he tased him and he giggled oh, we oh. tased him probably four or five times every time that he was tased he just was he it was like tickle me elmo he just started <laughs> laughing and we're like oh this is going to be a bad day. <laughs> it was like, okay, we got to take him down. So I grabbed him. I was trying to escort him to the ground. Now the fights, this could be superhuman like strength. And my face hits a futon, a metal futon. I break my nose and my orbital going down. And now he's scratching at my face. You know, eventually we get him in handcuffs. He goes by in the ambulance. He's in the hospital. And later on, we're talking to the doc. And he's like, he thought you guys were a swarm of bats. And that's why he was like scratching you so bad. You know, it's like, and we didn't want to hurt him. But, you know, but that's one instance where all the talking in the world is, is not going to help. He wasn't even on the same universe as us. <laughs> So once you get to that point, you know, it forces your only option and you try not to hurt the person. So I want to ask about when, um, I mean, I can see in many cases where the de-escalation works well, but if you're facing somebody who's armed, do you, how much room is there to de-escalate in those situations? Because once they raise a gun, if it's a handgun or something, you're, you know, you don't have much choice if they're raising a gun toward you or someone else. There's no one size fits all with any police work. You know, I told you a story of Ojo and I with the guy with a rifle to his kid's head. We yes. had more than enough justification to shoot him, but we didn't have a clear shot. So we're engaging him. If his finger would have went to the trigger, 
I would have had to have taken the shot. I wouldn't have had a choice. Hmm. But <laughs> and that's that's the gamble that I took. Could he have done that faster and shot his son before I could have popped a round off? Maybe. I don't know. But you can second guess this stuff till the cows come home. If I'm in a foot chase and somebody turns around and points a gun at me, there ain't no talking. If I'm in whatever situation, you point a gun at me, one of us is going to be leaving. Simple as that. You can ask me anything. I, I don't care. It, verbal judo or if you have any question about any kind of... I have of a question stuff. about the guns. <clears throat> excuse me. I've got a cough drop here. The gun situation yeah. in this country. Yeah. You know, as a police officer, <laughs> how do you approach finding a, a solution to that? What are the things you think need to happen? Boy, that's, that's an excellent question. I think it's a multi-prong approach. I can't tell you how many times I've arrested people for gun offenses. And if they didn't shoot somebody, it was probation, automatic, no matter how many previous gun convictions they've had. And as a cop, that's incredibly frustrating. Incredibly frustrating. It's like, okay, I almost shot this guy or I was in a situation where I could have shot this guy and you're giving him probation. It's a plea deal. He, and he's going to go back and he's going to do it again. It, it's like a revolving door. It just keeps happening and happening and happening. It's like a bad dream that never stops. Wisconsin was one of the last States to have CCW for citizens. And there was two sides to it that were arguing. One is like second amendment, we should have CCW, you know, carrying concealed weapon. Or there was the flip side is like, oh my God, crime is going to rise. It's going to be completely crazy off the charts. It happened and nothing happened. People who were going to get their CCW usually were not lawbreakers. Yeah. You know, they're going to classes, they're paying for their CCW, et cetera, et cetera. I, I had maybe two three instances where somebody that had a CCW didn't understand the law and when they could like start shooting at somebody. I never went to one where a CCW person shot and killed somebody. Not once. So there's, there's that. Now, as far as getting a CCW, I think it should be more than taking a, one or two hour class, I think you should be able to prove that you can use this weapon safely. You know, that's one big part of the equation that's missing, at least in Wisconsin it is. Uh, can it's I say that way in Colorado too? Yeah. Well, I, I did my concealed carry and mm -hmm. and I I don't handle a weapon. <laughs> Yeah, that doesn't After make I sense to class, me. After I left the class, I was free to carry a weapon. Right. I, I just took it to learn. Right. And it just doesn't make any sense to me. You know, it's like if you, if the state says it's okay for you to have this pistol, you know, in a holster that's concealed, you know, what if you do have to use it? You know, you might shoot an innocent person. You might shoot yourself. <laughs> you might, I mean, who knows? If you don't know how to use that gun, they're dangerous things. I think I but, took a better class here in Colorado because it was all day. You had okay. to shoot. You Good. had to be out in the range. You had to shoot. And um, I thought it was an excellent class. Um, I don't, I actually don't take it very, like uh, the only place I take it really is on my property. Yeah. But we have acreage, but um I'm not, I, I mean, I'm not like, you know, a, a great shot, but I could shot, shoot somebody that was, you know, close to me. Right. And Where did you take it, it Mary? Uh-huh. Where did well, you take it? I took it at the Colorado Centennial Glove Gun Club right here on Arapaho Road. Okay. It was mm. all day and it was by, a, the, the, the instructor was very good. Um, So 
I don't know. But, but almost as important as learning how to use that weapon is learning when you can use that weapon. That was like, part of the class, right? Yeah, that, and sometimes that's missed. And yeah, if you shoot and kill somebody, you have to explain why you did it. Right. Or you're going to prison. Right. And you should uh, have insurance. Yeah, you that's a part of the education. And right. you know, and like what you're talking about, you went through a range, you know, you learned how to use it, you learned when you can use it, etc. That's all great, but firearm being a good shot is a perishable skill you have to practice mm -hmm. so i think you should there should be some kind of recertification where you have to go to a range and prove that you can use this weapon safely and accurately not yeah i mean you don't have to <laughs> be shooting the wings off of mosquitoes or anything like that but you know i mean you should be able to shoot that silhouette in front of you from six feet away is that what they require of police? Um, actually, we go through a firearms qualification where I just did mine. Uh, and it's the same one that the cops go through when they're active. When you retire, if you retire in good standing, George Bush, I believe, signed into law, was law H.R. 218. And part of that law was retired law enforcement could carry their weapon pretty much anywhere, but you have to go every year to the police academy and you have to qualify just like you did when you were a police officer. The range of fire is you, you're shooting a silhouette from about, I think it's six or 10 feet away. And then from there, you're shooting with your right hand, then you're shooting with your left hand. Then you they keep on pushing you back, and you before you know it, you're shooting seventy five feet away. Oh my gosh! And you can't wow. miss more than three times. I missed once out of I think it was about thirty five, forty rounds. Well, what gun are you using? Uh, Sig P three sixty five. Is that your service weapon for Milwaukee? No, that, that's a compact dumb gun. Um, when I was on, we started with Glocks. That was a 40 caliber semi-automatic Glock. Then we went to Smith and Wesson. That was a 40 caliber semi-automatic. And then we went to the SIG. I think it was the um, P30. It was like a mid-size. And that was a nine millimeter. So I like the SIGs. I just they fit in my hand really well. And yeah, I I've been going back. I retired when I was 55 and I'm 59 now and never had a problem. I think there's got to, you know, as far as the answer to gun violence, you know, there's more guns than people in this country. So the toothpaste is out of the tube. Yeah. More laws. Mm -hmm. Well, more laws don't mean a whole lot when you don't enforce the ones that we already have. I can't, like I said before, I can't tell you how many times either they get probation or they don't get anything. And unless you shoot and kill somebody, then you're going to get some. But other than that, no. Nope. Wild West. Yep. Well, listen, we are getting toward the end of our hour and a half here. Do we have another burning question before we wrap it up? Like I said, it doesn't have to be verbal judo. If you have any police -y questions, I'm I'm down. I, I have a follow-up, and I, I don't mean to put you on the spot here. Um, Not a problem. Your fellow uh, uh, law enforcement people, but um, I, obviously it's, it sounds like you do a great job at this de-escalating, de and some of your partners have done a great job. But out of the uh, a force, a whole force in a, in a city or whatever, how many are – are really good at that or even try how many are simply aggressive from the get-go you know they go in hard as you say um is i, I may not be exact numbers or percentages but give me an idea what, of what how many every, people really follow what you do every district that i've worked at you know say there was like 30 35 people on late shift there was always that one guy or gal like I said, that could make Mother Teresa 
or Gandhi a fight? Lauren Boebert. <laughs> you know, you're just like, what is wrong with you? And usually they wind up to the point where nobody wants to work with them anymore and they're ostracized because they don't know how to talk to some people. Mm. None of us like that. None how of us long do they last on the force? Well, they'll probably get promoted or they get an inside <laughs> job. <laughs> oh. yeah. They'll get an inside job or they'll get promoted. They'll take them off the street. Mm. Oh, man. That's distressing. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> there's still, I mean, take some solace in the fact that 99.9% .9 of the cops I worked with were yeah. all had a good heart. They wanted to do the right thing. And they didn't, you know, egg people on or hope that it would be some big fight or confrontation. Like I said, no, but none of us wanted that. None of yeah. us. Well, I think, oh, I'm, I'm just going to say, I think that, you know, I, I taught school for a while and I, I retired, but um, teaching middle school and secondary ed, you deal a lot with police. <laughs> Yeah. especially when you teach in the inner city sure. and even in the suburban regions. And I worked with the gang unit involved in, in some of those things. And, and I, I have to say though, that um, th what you're saying is so true because most of the officers that I saw really handled the kids. Well, you know, they did a lot of what you were saying, talk to them, try to empathize with them, tried to convince them, how their life could be a little better if they made a better decision. And um, and I just gonna say, as teaching in my profession, I saw that that really worked. Yeah. Yeah, great point. Yeah. Because some so, of those kids, they're not, you know, they don't, they don't think through things. <laughs> no, and that's no. being a kid, right? I, I find it remarkable that you can actually, in some cases, get a CCW permit without firing a gun. Because I remember the first time that I fired my little 380 Saturday night special, it scared the hell out of me. <laughs> yeah. It's loud, it's violent, you know, and you know, you just, if you don't know what's coming, you know, fire that thing off and you're gonna go, oh shit, and drop it, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. Shoot yeah. somebody that way. Yeah, in a perfect world, you know, I would think that you should go through at least 40 hours of like live firearms training before you should get a CCW, but it's not a perfect world and you should have 40 hours of classroom. You know, it's like, okay, this is when this is appropriate. This is when you can't, you know, this is when you can't use it. And if you do use it, this is how you're going to verbalize when the police officer or detective is going to be talking to you or a DA. It's like, okay, I feared for my safety or you know, my loved one's safety, not somebody who was stealing my car and I thought I'd, you know, scare them by lobbing some rounds over their head. That doesn't work. Well, Patrick, thank you so much for your time tonight. I think we're really blessed to have yes, people like you on the street. It was wonderful very much. Thanks, yeah. Kathleen. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank, thank, thank you, you, Kathleen. Kathleen. Well, thank you guys, and it's it's a pleasure. And if you have any questions, like I said, feel free. I